Uh, this is March 23rd, 2005. Uh, I'm Joe Bruckner. I'm at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And we're interviewing Mr. Chester Cohen in connection with the uh, Veterans History Project. And Mr. Cohen has kindly agreed to come in here and meet with us for a while and tell us about his experiences during World War II. Uh, Mr. Cohen, thank you very much for taking your time and coming in here to share your experiences with us. You're welcome. Uh, would you give us your complete name, your date of birth, and where you were born? I'm Chester T. Cohen. I was born in Chicago, April 2nd, 1916. And where do you live now? I live in Roswell, Georgia. Okay. Mr. Cohen, would you tell us a little bit about your upbringing, where you were born, a little bit about your family? As I said, I was born in Chicago, as were my mother and dad. <clears throat> so we go back three generations. I was educated in the Chicago school system and uh, eventually got married. That had nothing to do with my education. <laughs> uh, and subsequently uh, worked in the furniture industry, which has been my family's business, and uh, subsequently got called into service uh, although I did have at the time a three-month-old child. Uh, and eventually I was inducted into the service at Camp Grant and sent to uh, Camp Landing, which is south of Jacksonville, Florida, for my basic training. When you got called in, what was your feeling? Having, having a child and a family, what, what did you feel at the time? Somewhat upset, but I understood that there was no alternative. Uh, this is something that had to be done. I spent uh, my basic training in, as I said, in Camp Landing, Florida for 13 weeks. Uh, I trained as a cryptographer, which is uh, coding and decoding messages, uh, part of the communication system of the military. And uh, from Camp Landing, I went back home to Chicago for a short very short stay, then aboard the train to Camp Ord in California. From Camp Ord, I was transferred with our group to Pittsburgh, California, which is in San Francisco Bay. And where we were boarded the ship, I was fortunate, if you can say that, to be assigned to the SS Hermitage, which was taken over by the Navy. It had been a an Italian cruise liner traversing the Panama Canal at the time war broke out and was confiscated by our government. Uh, being a cruise liner, she was faster than most transports, so when we went overseas, we had no escorts. And uh, we eventually were heading south across the equator, and we didn't know whether we were going to Australia or where because Few of us ever heard of New Guinea, which is ultimately where we landed at a small island off the tip of New Guinea, uh, which is Milne Bay. Um, the island was called Good Enough, but we never found out what it was good enough for. <laughs> uh, it had been occupied by natives, blacks, and the females were moved to a different island for obvious reasons. And uh, uh, our main body had already moved up the coast of New Guinea, so we replacements were assigned to loading the ships with the uh, equipment that was left. And we boarded these vessels, and eventually, as the ships were loaded, we evacuated the island and moved up the coast on uh, landing ships. What, what unit were you in? Were you in a particular unit at the time? I was assigned to the 20, uh, the uh, 2nd Battalion of the 34th Infantry Regiment, 24th Division. In those days, the 24th was foot soldiers, not mechanized as they are today. The 24th and 25th Divisions were called pineapple outfits because they were originally based in Hawaii. And when war broke out after Pearl Harbor, uh, 
the first thing our government did was assign these two divisions to Australia because we felt that was the ultimate target of the Japanese military. Were you still involved at all in, in cryptography at the time? Well, ironically, there was no need for my services as such. When we moved up to Hollandia, which was the uh, focal base, uh, where we were accumulating men and ships for the invasion of the Philippines. Uh, there was little, the, although the 24th did have quite a few combats all along the coast of New Guinea, I did not see any of that action. Uh, I was basically, after we got to a Hollandia assigned to islands down in the harbor to prevent any further Japanese inclusion. What was the time period that, that you got into New Guinea or and that you were going over there? What year and month? That was 1944. Was, uh, I had left the States uh, in March and got there in 40, at the end of March. And of course, there in Hollandia Harbor, which is one of the largest harbors in the country, in the world, uh, just south of the equator. So the weather was not very conducive. And ironically, on the uh, travels from uh, Goodenough Island to Hollandia, we had loaded the vessels with the cases of food that had been packed in Australia. and. Uh, as we opened these cases, we found most of it, the Australians didn't have the knack of preserving canned goods as we did. And we had to dump most of the food overboard because it was maggoty. And that was the first time in my life that I had to depend on someone else for food. Uh, when the sailors of the uh, uh, landing craft found out that we didn't have much food stuff, they would overload their trays and bring them out to the uh, stern of the vessel, which was called the fantail, and we guys would finish up the trays. Uh, that's where the ships had their garbage. It was always on the fantail in big uh, garbage cans. So on the pretext of emptying their trays, they would bring them out to us. and. Uh, it was quite uh, interesting, the fact that our, although these were Navy people, they took care of the Army. Yeah. What was New Guinea like? I mean, what was your reaction coming from well, Chicago? Well, I and New Guinea? didn't see much action in New Guinea uh, because I was a replacement and had come up on the rear end of it. But from New Guinea, from Hollandia is where we assembled all our ships and all for the ultimate invasion of Leyte in the Philippines for the liberation. And uh, that was quite a, an interesting thing. We went up on Navy transports and uh, you asked when I got involved with cryptography overseas. I never did because when we hit the beaches of Leyte, unfortunately, the young man who was the battalion commander's runner or messenger as technic we called them runners, but they're technically messengers. And all of a sudden, I, as I was on the beach, prone like all the rest of us, uh, because we were under fire at that time from Japanese, uh, I get a tap on the back and the first sergeant of the company said, you're to report to Jim. I said, who is Jim? He said, well, that's the colonel. And that's where I first found out, you never, uh, uh, although we were told in the States always to use the commander's office in the combat, that was the kiss of death. Uh, all the officers wore their insignias under their lapels yeah. so they wouldn't be identified because the favorite trick of the Japanese was to hide up in bamboo trees and uh, look down and try to spot the officers because the Japanese philosophy of the military was different than ours. In Japan, or the Japanese, only the officers knew the operations, what the planning were. The, the men, ordinary combat soldier, 
just took orders. He did not know anything about it, which is opposite of us. Before we went into combat, everyone knew the operation all the way down, so that no matter if you lost an officer, sometimes a sergeant would take over the operations. Even the PFC knew what the goals were. And, but the Japanese never understood this, so they constantly targeted our officers. Well, anyway, I get this tap on the back and told to report to Jim. It turns out Jim was the battalion colonel, and I was to become his messenger, so I never did see cryptography. Oh. <laughs> I wound up uh, during the whole Philippine campaign as uh, Jim's messenger. What was your rank at this point? You're My right. rank was PFC. Okay. I never grew out of beyond that okay. because there was no particular reason. Yeah. So you were on Leyte. Is this was this on Leyte? Yes, this sir. Happened? And that was the original landing on Leyte ahead of Judge Douglas MacArthur. Would you describe that landing and your your feelings and what you were doing well, when you had to get off? First of all, you don't have too much chance for feelings. You react. Mm -hmm. uh, we the landing involves coming off of the transports into landing craft. Uh, these landing crafts are, as you may have seen from videos, uh, more or less like a barge with a ramp in the front. And when the, uh, whoever the uh, Navy chap is that's operating the landing craft says hit it, he was dropping that ramp as close to the beach as he could, and you got off whether you were in two feet of water or four feet of water. You may have seen this in the invasion of Normandy, pictures of it. Much the same was in the islands when we had landings. And, of course, the first thing you did because of fire from the enemy, you hit the beach and you laid prone. And as I said before, the young man who had been the messenger for the colonel was hit right off the bat. So uh, that's, we took that, some uh, operational losses at that time. Uh, eventually after the first fire and uh, we started getting some uh, gunfire from our sh Navy craft, so that it cleared the way for us to penetrate further into the island, we got to the first road that circumvented the uh, area and uh, the Japanese were on one side of the road, we were on the other, firing like crazy. Uh, nobody knows if you hit anybody, you hoped you didn't, but if you did, well, so be it. And eventually, uh, the heavy fire from our Navy ships subdued the Japanese so that we could penetrate further inland. I know I keep going back to feelings, but were you scared at the time? You're or? damn right. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have time to, to feel, consider your feelings. Yeah. You react to everything. Yeah. Uh, if you hear gunfire from one side, you approach that side. Uh, I don't believe anybody really has any sense of feeling because you've become pretty automated as an operation piece of equipment. And you just move on and do what you're told, follow directions. Uh, if your sergeant says you move out, you move out. You, you just don't have time to do any thinking. Eventually we did gain the first ridge of the island. And there was when we really got frightened because we're sitting up at the top of this ridge and all of a sudden we looked down at the bay and our ships were leaving the harbor. And we said, my God, are they deserting us, leaving us here? What we didn't know, what we found out very soon, was Japanese bombers, the Bettys, started coming in. So the fleet wisely got out to sea. Otherwise, they'd have been sitting ducks in the harbor. And we were witness to a beautiful, if you can call it that, dogfight between our planes coming off of our carrier, escort carrier, and these Japanese bombers. Eventually they cleaned them out and the ships came back into the harbor. But uh, we were witness to this dogfight 
uh, uh, but uh, originally when we saw the ships leaving, because at that time we didn't see any Japanese craft, but we just saw the ship, but they had gotten warnings, so they moved out to sea. But uh, eventually we moved into uh, Lady over a period of weeks, and uh, there was an interesting spot up on the northern tip of Lady was a ranch operated by uh, descendants of Spain, Spanish people who originally had occupied the Philippines. And they had an interesting way of handling their cattle. They would put them on little bitty islands off the coast, and they didn't have to worry about fencing because oh. the cattle would go into the <laughs> ocean. Pretty clever. So they would just park a head or two of cattle, and uh, we were sent up there, and that was my first experience with what we called ducks, amphibious craft. There were merely trucks that were built to go into the water because there was no road going up to this ranch. We had to go up by the coastline by way of ducks, many of which now are used in different uh, areas of the United States. They're still being used uh, for recreation purposes. And um, a group of us were sent out, a company or two, just to protect this ranch from because the Japanese were moving northward as we chased them from the south, and we went up there to prevent them from taking over this ranch area. So you were on the ground protecting them, or moving? moving. Yes, we landed on the ranch you, site oh, yeah, and took up landed. positions along uh, various routes that the Japanese might want to infiltrate. Okay. Uh, Continue on with your experiences on, on Lady. Well, Leyte was an interesting island, but we did, the Japanese had thoroughly invaded the island and had a tremendous amount of military there. We finally got to the main road, which went north, uh, south to north, and uh, this is taking over weeks of time because you didn't move much per day. Uh, one of my interesting experiences was the colonel's bodyguard and myself and the operations sergeant. We were the five, the colonel, the operations captain, the three of us enlisted men. We didn't get any new rations or supplies for weeks. When the uh, bodyguard and I, when our fatigues got full of mud, we just went into the nearest river and washed off the mud and put it on. And ultimately this led to what is called jungle rot that I had in my legs. Just huge ulcers, uh, just from being wet all damp all the time. But uh, it just seemed that we were up in the front all the time and when the supplies did come in uh, to our headquarters and supply office, we were never there to get them until one the time we came in, and the colonel told us, he said, dress decently tomorrow morning, we're going up to uh, battalion, to regimental headquarters. So we told him, he said, well, colonel, we don't have any other clothes, this is it. We are never here when the issue finally caught up with us. So he went to the first sergeant, the sergeant, the supply sergeant, and told him, he says, I want, you're about coincides. I want two sets of steaks for him. He went to the mail clerk and says, you're about Jay Perpignia's size. He was the bodyguard. I want two sets of fatigue. Well, uh, they stammered. No, he said, this is it. He said, these men came. By that time, our fatigues had hold. We looked like something out of Valley Forge. So ultimately, we did get replacement equipment. Uh, as we moved up this road, Ultimately, we came to quite a good-sized stream. I guess you'd call it a river, really. And the Japanese had built a uh, pillbox from coconut logs. And coconut logs were wonderful for building such uh, positions because they would absorb bullets like a sponge. You could fire heavy machine guns and it would take a, a mortar shell. 
or an artillery shell to destroy them. So they were blocking the road across this river. There was a bridge, and uh, the only alternative we had was to go downstream and cross with a body of our, our main body of troops and come around and assault the Japanese from a flank. Uh, we left one company on the far side of the river to guard our retreat in case we had to retreat. And ultimately, we uh, hit a clearing and we were fortunate enough to outflank the Japanese position, at which time the boss told me to go back and bring the men back, bring this F Company back across the river and join the rest of the troops. And in the, by across uh, the river, which was about chest high, and I reported to the commander, the company commander, told him to move his people across the river and join the rest of us. And he said, well, you come with us. I said, no, I better go back and report to Jim that the, you have the message. As I'm crossing the river, I get, I'm coming under Japanese fire. So let me tell you, I got under that water as fast as I could because bullets will ricochet in water. They won't follow straight through. And ultimately, I was able to cross the river and climb the bank and report it back to the commander that the best check, that's the reason for the Purple Heart. But uh, ultimately, of course, we conquered Leyte and cleared the way for the liberation. And uh, eventually, we were sent back for R&R. R&R in that area consisted of being a perimeter for the artillery. Uh, because when you're in the jungles as we were, Unlike Europe, you didn't have any cities. There was no place to go for real R&R. &R. There was no hospitals. Everything was just jungle or uh, rural areas. Uh, ultimately, we went back to for R&R, &R and we guarded a uh, artillery perimeter. And uh, eventually, uh, our units were again put aboard transports and we went up to uh, Luzon. Uh, it was interesting and fortunately for us that when we got to the coast of Luzon, we had a, um, a quiet landing. There was absolutely no opposition. And uh, at that time is when my jungle rot broke out. And uh, I was on this Navy transport along with several other fellows who had similar problems. The Navy wanted us to go back um, with the ships, but our uh, medical officer decided we were in good enough shape to land. And despite bandages and whatever, not to try to be heroic, but we were told to land with the troops, which we did. And as I say, there was no opposition. We went in mile after mile after mile and never met any Japanese. Uh, eventually, we would break every 50 minutes, which is tradition when the military's on the march, take a 10 minute break. And eventually, vehicles started coming in. They had been offloaded. And the uh, medic officer came up and checked us out said, you okay? Yeah, we're okay. That's what you, had, you did in the Army. You were always okay. Because there was no use bitching or complaining. It didn't mount anything anyway. So ultimately, we went in. And eventually, my, uh, the ulcers broke and my bandages got bloodied. And so did two other young men. I was the old man of the outfit at that time. I was 28. And the others were 19, 20, 21 year old young fellows. Uh, the uh, medical officer said, well, look, you guys stay here. We're going to set up an aid station. And you help the medics set up the aid station. Well, I hate to say this, but that was a blessing because the rest of our people moved up 
towards uh, the main objective, which was Manila, and ultimately uh, the islands where they had chased, the Japanese had chased our people. And the next thing I knew, two days later, we had set up the aid station, and pretty soon they started bringing our people back in trucks. We didn't have ambulances to them. Unfortunately, a major who had taken over command of our outfit did the disastrous decision, made the disastrous decision against all basic training. There was a series of ridges guarding the road into Manila. And instead of putting our people under the lee of the closest ridge, he parked them on the far side, which left them exposed to enemy mortar fire. And so, you're the only survivor of headquarters company because I was in the hospital. The mortar fire completely wiped out our people, and I was able to identify the first sergeant's body by his ring. Just because of a stupid mistake made by an officer. Ultimately, I was evacuated and put aboard a Navy transport back to Finch Avenue, New Guinea, where I was in the hospital for several weeks and ultimately on the transport back to the States. And once back in the States, I went to a hospital in Galesburg, Illinois, which was the closest to Chicago. And after a week, of I was allowed, I was then transported to Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio and uh, finished the hospital there where they cleared up my legs. And I received orders that I was going to be sent to a prisoner of war camp called the Atlanta Prisoner of War Camp. So I quickly called my wife and said, we find you can come down to Atlanta, Atlanta and visit me. Well, it turns out that the Atlanta Prisoner of War Camp was not Atlanta, Georgia, but 200 miles west of Omaha, Nebraska, near a community called Hole Ridge, Nebraska, as far out in the prairie as you can go. And uh, this was January. The whole rich, the prisoner of war camp was uh, contained originally German prisoners of war, but I, I'm, most people did not realize at the time that these German prisoners were actually working out in the farms because the farm guys were all overseas. And by this time the war in Europe was over, so what we were doing is going down in convoys of trucks bringing these prisoners back to camp, ultimately to be put on trains and shipped to New York and back to Germany. Uh, it was an interesting experience because some of the German prisoners of war worked in our PX, and I have a beautiful uh, wall hanging of an Indian carved by one of these prisoners of war which I value quite a bit. Did you get to know some of them pretty well? Oh yes, they worked in the PX and all they would ask was about German cities such as Milwaukee, St. Louis, Cincinnati. They did not realize that if the law at that time stated that if you bore arms against this country you were not eligible to come in as an immigrant. So we were cautioned not to mention this to these guys to discourage them, let them think it. Well, as it happened after the war, we know that thousands 
of German former military, including officers, were allowed into the United States, some who had high ranks in the Nazi army. So, so much for laws. And ultimately, when my points came up, I was discharged back at Camp Grant. What was your feeling when the bomb was dropped in Japan? Since, uh, well, I was back stateside at right. the time. To me, it saved probably millions of lives on both sides. Because if we would have had to invade the islands, it would have taken tremendous number of men and equipment to try to do that. The alternative would be we had pretty well cleared up the air as far as Japanese planes were concerned. So we pretty much controlled the air, even over Japan. And we would have just had to bomb the living devil out of the Japanese cities, which would have killed millions of their civilians. So while the bomb did tremendous damage, it perhaps saved millions of lives on both sides. Could have saved yours, I guess. Could, I mean, you could well, have, I was already stateside. Could so. you have eventually been sent over, though, if there had been more combat over there? Uh, well, you see, at the time, German war was the war in Europe was over, right. so some of those guys were starting to be shipped to the Pacific. So the bomb just eliminated the necessity of invading the Japanese homeland, which was, no doubt, saved millions of lives. What happened after you left the POW camp? Was that your last assignment? Or? Yes, I was, uh, uh, eventually, uh, my, we were discharged according to the number of points that you had. The points were created by your length of service, combat experience, and so forth. And when your points came up, you were automatically uh, discharged, and I was sent back home, uh, back to my wife and child. Ultimately, uh, went back into the furniture business. Did you ever stay in contact with any of those POWs? No, no, because they would go have uh, been sent back to Germany originally, initially. No. When you were, particularly in Leyte and Luzon, and when you came back here, did you realize you were part of one of the most significant events in American, certainly American history and oral history? Did you realize how big this was? Not really, because you like were just a little cog in a tremendous, tremendous operation. Uh, although. The American soldier, unlike the Japanese soldier, had a different aspect and outlook on the war and so forth. We weren't serfs like they were. They were literally serfs. Uh, they were just cannon fodder as far as their officers were concerned. Whereas our military treated you as a, a human, uh, a necessary cog in a big machine. Uh, I don't think any of us really took time to consider what the whole picture was. We knew we were in a, a life and death struggle, but uh, as far as being a historic or something, I don't think any of us gave a darn. When did you get your bronze star? Did you get that after you got back? or did I didn't anything? know I had it. It was sent back home. And it wasn't until I got home that uh, my wife gave it to me because the uh, paperwork and all, I, like I say, there was, it wasn't like in Europe where you had communities, you had cities. We had nothing over there. And uh, so as far as citations and stuff, that never was presented over there in, in the combat area. Uh, you brought your Bronze Star and the citation. I'd like to get that on the tape if we could, if you could just hold that up. And I know you mentioned briefly what you received it for, but would you go back over that just very briefly while we've got, got you there well, with the Bronze Star? basically the citation says that I can carried out many op uh, operations as a, my job as a messenger bringing 
messages back and forth. Well, you should be very proud of that. Well, actually, you know, they talk about, Joe, they talk about heroism. I don't, there are two ways you get a, a, an award. Some are heroic. If a man like in Europe, you didn't see much of this in the Pacific, where you would have these stories of a guy leaving a foxhole and going after a German machine gun nest and by himself wipe out a half a dozen guys. Now that's heroic. To do something you were told to do and you carried it out, that doesn't mean to me to be heroism. You fulfilled the job. That's all. So I don't consider that Bronze Star particularly heroic because it was something that I did, I was told to do. It was my job to do. And all I did was carry out the operation. Well, we consider it heroic. Well, and, uh, <laughs> that's up to you, but I don't. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we close the interview about your experiences in the military or after you got out or if you just your all I can about say anything? is what all of our generals have said war is hell nobody likes it but sometimes you have to do it and uh, as far as today's situation most of our people do not understand that if we don't win this war in Iraq we're going to be fighting them here they are already here. There's no question that there are Al-Qaeda cells in this country today. They come up easily from Mexico. Uh, unfortunately, we're not guarding that border. And there's been cases where what they call mules, Mexicans who bring others across the border, were caught, one mule was caught with four Arabs not far outside of San Diego trying to cross the border, but fortunately they nailed them. How many are not caught, we don't know. And these fool people that are to stop the war and are worrying about peace and this, there is no peace. We are at war for survival of our Western civilization. Unfortunately, people have not learned the very bitter lesson. Those who do not learn from history are bound to repeat it. Twice before, Muslims have invaded West. In the, year, in the years of 800, Muslim Moors from North Africa invaded and conquered Spain and Portugal and held it until 1492, ironically, the day Columbus landed here. In the 1300s, Ottoman Turks invaded Europe and they got as far as Vienna. Many of these Muslims are still, their descendants are there today in the Balkans, where we protected Muslims in the Balkans. It wasn't, owned, ironically, a rainstorm stopped the Turks from conquering Vienna. It was fortunate. The, the fields got flooded and they couldn't move their artillery. And ultimately, a consortium of king's armies moved them back. At that time, the Ottoman Turks controlled both sides of the Mediterranean and as far east as current Iran. They were powerful, and they kept that power until after World War II because they sided with Germany, and when Germany, I mean World War I, they sided with Germany. When Germany lost the war, the British and French carved up the Ottoman Empire, leaving the mess that we have today. But unfortunately, history is being de-emphasized today. And you can't learn from history if they don't teach it. And it's sad to me as an oldster who spent, in my school days, a whole semester in history, a whole semester in civics, because the schools were also teaching citizenship. Today, history is a smattering of social studies. And I find that pathetic. Because if young people don't know history, they're bound to repeat it.
Yeah, there's no doubt about that. You're, you're saying that in the right place being here in the History Center. And, uh, we hopefully you know, start teaching history more. And, uh, well, it's pathetic, Joe, because I only have a high school education, but I love history. And I remember it well. Uh, I pride myself that I, I can't remember somebody I met yesterday. <laughs> but I recall, for example, is this off now? No. <laughs> I'd like to continue the discussion, though, but I, before, before we turn it off, I, uh, I, I do want to... For wanna... example, one of the things that I read many, many, many years ago, but it was also presented on the PBS program, The Civil War. A group of men were meeting with President Lincoln, and they asked him, Mr. President, what nation or consortium of nations could defeat the United States? He mulled it over and he said, gentlemen, this nation shall never be defeated from without. And by golly, we've done it. Well, you're obviously a student of history, and it, it, whether you admit it or not, you're part of history because of what you did in World War II. And as I said before, we not only appreciate what you did by coming down here, but we appreciate what you did in the war. And uh, well, thank you. We're honored to have had you here, and and thank you for telling us your story. I'm sorry I break out, but no, that's completely understandable. That's completely understandable.